Hello, everybody, and welcome to the this week's Hangout. We're in Module 6 of the Planetary Boundaries MOOC. Um, and today, I'm really, really happy to welcome Kate Rayworth, um, who's joining us from Oxford. Kate, would you like to say hello to everybody? Hello, um, and I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, and I've loved seeing the questions that have appeared online and some of the questions that were sent to me in advance, so I'm raring to go for a great discussion. <laughs> Excellent. Um, as I'm sitting here, I get to choose the first question to... Um, did you want me to say a little bit about where I'm coming from? Oh, yes, I'm so sorry about that. Yes, please introduce yourself properly, Kate. <laughs> well, or should I just say a little bit about the background of the... Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm Kate Rayworth. I, um, I'm, based, I'm based in Oxford um, and I love planetary boundaries. And as you may have seen some, from some of the videos or reports I've written, I've, I've doodled on planetary boundaries and, and extended it to, into a donut. So I'll just say a little bit about what where that came from. So I trained as an economist uh, at university 25 years ago, and I studied economics and then did a master's in uh, development economics, but was always really frustrated by the economics that I was taught because it blatantly ignored the planet. When I was at university, it wasn't even possible to do an option in environmental economics, let alone any concept of ecological economics. So I was very frustrated by the vacuum of environmental thinking and connection within economic theory. And so I walked away from economics and never called myself an economist because I didn't want to identify with that. Then many decades later, after working in the villages of Zanzibar at the UNDP in New York and for a decade for Oxfam, one day somebody showed me a diagram called Nine Planetary Boundaries and the classic picture of the 2009 picture. And I had this adrenaline rush immediately because I felt that what I was seeing was a really important rebalancing between the disciplines. I felt that I was seeing a picture that said to me, we natural scientists are communicating with the world of economics and we're saying to economists, if you can't show that the economy exists within the environment, then we're going to do it for you. In fact, we've already done it. And here we are, here's nine planetary boundaries within which the economy must exist. And by the way, we've plotted out its metrics. We've, we're looking for the limitations or the, the boundaries of that space. And by the way, they're in our metrics, not your metrics. So it's not plotted in dollars. It's plotted in tons of carbon, tons of nitrogen, kilometers cubed of water. So I found that a really important and exciting political power rebalancing between the disciplines. And it was called the Safe Operating Space for Humanity. And I was sitting in Oxfam, just over from my desk was a team responding to a humanitarian crisis in East Africa. Others were responding to crises in other parts of the world where people didn't have food. They were drilling wells because people didn't have water. And I thought, this entire space where humanity doesn't put too much pressure on the planet, that's not safe. Because if we don't put any pressure on the planet, millions of people are left in destitution. So we have to put some sort of food on the planet to meet everybody's human rights. And so I got out my pen and I thought that space at the center of the circle is, is not a desirable space, just as beyond the planetary boundaries is unacceptable environmental degradation so right at the center is unacceptable human deprivation and hence I drew in what I call the social foundation and the circle turned into a shape which looks more like a donut and that's where the idea of the donut came from um, I've been amazed by the traction it's had and I might I can talk about that a little bit later but what I do want to say today is I'm in the middle of updating it, so I'm going to be coming out with Donut 2.0, hopefully early in the new year. And so this is one of those moments where it can be changed. It can be influenced, some of the words can be changed. And I, I'm just saying that right now at the outset of this MOOC, because I would love to crowdsource ideas from everybody who's here. If you have any ideas for what you think it should, how you think it should be changed, anything at all, just pop them down as a, not necessarily as a question, as a comment or a point, and I would love to hear them. Thanks. Excellent. We've actually got loads of questions, and I can see that there are lots of people sort of typing questions up as we go along. So I wanted to sort of start with the, I mean, you've mentioned the fact that you've come from a, a, a 
context working on anti-poverty issues and several of the questions really relate to the rich poor divide or rich countries and poor countries um, so that, I mean there's a, a, a couple of questions that were sent in before this started um, kicking and worrying the, the lovely idea by Guy Hancock that we could pair up developed countries with undeveloped countries in a kind of um, buddying system where um, where the countries would be able to work together to reach development and sustainability. Um, there's also a whole load of questions about, there's a question here about payments for, un, for environmental service, <laughs> payment for environmental services with um, underdeveloped countries having, a, a, you know, working in a more close cooperative relationship with developed countries. Do you have any thoughts on that, Kate, on the kind of how rich and poor countries can work together for global sustainability and where the responsibility line falls? Yeah, so just picking up on, on Guy Hancock's question, uh, suggestion, I thought it was a lovely idea and it immediately made me, he said that these countries would have to um, compete together. <laughs> They would have to work as a team and it immediately made me think of a three-legged race you know when two people are running along and they have their legs tied together and they have to run along together and so they can't run faster than each other and it's a lovely idea of you have to actually work as a team um in practical terms though i i don't think that nation states and governments are going to be the best cooperators in that kind of space. but i think at the level of a city or a town then you're going to be tapping into civic cooperation as opposed to the state and of course that's why so many countries have twinned towns you drive into a town and it says welcome to brighton twinned with somewhere and somewhere and of course it's also the idea behind projects like uh, 100 resilient cities yes. uh, which is trying to develop a global network of cities that want to be resilient and their mayors meet together and seeing each other ideas and examples so they're coming along like in a, a hundred legged race um so i think it's really great that cities and towns from very rich very poor countries can collaborate and work together and i so that that spirit of collaboration is great um the, the rich and the poor still at the heart of why we are simultaneously over planetary boundaries and underneath the social foundation. Um, inequality in the world is, to me, the number one explanatory factor for that. Whether it's inequality of wealth, 80, 80 billionaires in the world own the same wealth as the poorest half of the world's population. Whether it's inequality of income and earning, inequality of uh, trade rules and the way that trade rules are biased against low-income countries and inequality of control over the earth's resources who gets to buy the night who gets to cre create the nitrogen fertilizer and use it who gets to command the world's food supply so it's not it's no surprise that inequality runs through so many of these questions because it is the, the thing we need to tackle and if we're smart we use the framework of planetary boundaries together with the donut to highlight inequality at the global scale and why if you want to create sustainability you have to tackle inequality mm. i can think of another the, the sort of the networking and working together theme of that is also behind the idea of the um transition towns yes and things like that um and i'd also flag a, another growing conversation that's happening between rich and poor countries there's an initiative called the Converging World that uses the idea of contraction and convergence that was originally proposed for greenhouse gas emissions only, but also to really exactly that, look at how larger scale communities can work together um, to achieve a more, a more equal world um, in the future. So I think it is very interesting to see that these discussions are happening at many different levels. And you're right, it isn't just we don't just rely on our national governments to make our sustainability choices for us. There are many opportunities for that. Um, there's several questions that I, um, aha, okay, sorry, I'm also back to this reading what's on the screen. Um, I'm going to come back to that. There's a question about money, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. There's a whole series of questions that I'm, I see as, limiting the social sphere 
there's questions about what do we do with population? Isn't the problem really a population problem? Um, overpopulation. So in one of our earlier questions, um, Sabina Lautensach sent a question about population. We've also got um, a question by Masoud Purbozorg. Sorry, I can't read with, uh, either with or without my glasses right there. Um, how can we deal with eradicating poverty considering that population is growing so much and it's going to be a major problem into, you know, into the 21st century? Um, Right. Should we just tackle that one because it's a really yeah. good one. Yes. It keeps coming up. So go on. So let me just grab the donut. Here we are. I have a donut that I made earlier. Um, sometimes when I've presented this, people have immediately put their hand up and said, Why isn't population part of the social foundation? It really matters, but it's not one of the mentions. The, 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 the way population comes in here is it's a real key determinant. As you could say, how thick this space is, because it takes resources to meet everyone's rights to all of these essential needs. And you can immediately understand that as the world population grows, then this circle is going to get bigger because it's going to take more resources to meet the rights of more people, just by pure maths. So the bigger the world population gets, in a sense, the thinner the donut space gets. So it really matters. And some people have said to me, how do you know the donut exists at all for how many of we are? So we're 7 billion today. My instinct, we could easily be living inside the donut today. We're set to be over 9 billion by 2050. And then the UN's projections say that they think we're going to be 11 billion by 2100. So the space is getting thin. Now, the relationship's complex because what is it that causes population growth? Yes, it's poverty in low-income countries. When, when women don't have control over their bodies, when their children don't survive past the age of one or the age of five, when they can't feed their children, when girls are pulled out of school and married off early, when women have no power in the home or can't get job, job opportunities in their own their income, all of these things disempower women from controlling their own bodies and deciding how many children to have. And if you flip all of that around and provide health for infants, nutrition for kids, get all girls in school, empower women, and they enable women to go into the workplace, they manage the size of their families and in turn that manages down the global population. So in fact, getting everybody with gender equality over the social foundation is the way to slow down the global population growth rate. So it's a really nice connection. But of course, the global population isn't only growing because families in low-income countries are having more children. The global population is also growing because of wealth. Because we, wealthy nations, are living longer. We're sticking around longer. So the global population is going to exceed 9 billion because our parents and us and our children are going to live longer and longer lives. So it's really important to think that population is just about people somewhere else having too many kids. It's about all of us enduring for longer as well. So it's a sign of success. But the key message is, we want to slow down the rate of global population growth, get everybody over the social foundation, invest in gender equality, health and education. And that is the best way to do it. It does matter, though. It really does matter. And it's important not to brush population issues aside. I really like that answer because one of the things that often happens when people talk about population is people don't talk about the how. So thanks for bringing that so nicely into the... Uh, I'm hoping everybody enjoys that discussion too and takes it back with them. Um, there are several questions now relating to money. Um, there's, let me just come back again. There's a question by Kiran um, on, the, on the money system. Do we have scope, I'm not sure if you can see this yet, Kate. Do we have the scope to create a new system to replace the money system so that we can make sure that ecosystem services play out in this safe zone? Um, I'll that's see the question. Good. Uh, okay. It's coming up. Okay, no, I did. Do we have the scope to create a new money system to replace the present money system so that we can ensure ecosystem services stay in a safe zone? I want to work on such a new system. Okay, Kieran, great question. Hang on one second. <laughs>
the textbook? <laughs> um, right. Money. <laughs> yeah, okay, money. I'd say a song. Go on. <laughs> three things. Um, one, money is a social relationship. Money means I trust you that you will repay me. So money is all about constructing social relationships, and money is designed. It has to me. It has three fundamental design features. Who creates it? and therefore issues it, so where it comes from. The character it's given, for example, most money bears interest, so if I lend you some money, I expect you to pay me back with interest. And thirdly, what it's used for. What, what, what can this money be used for, or what does it get channeled into? Does money, so for example, now we have commercial banks are in the UK where I am, 97% of the money that's actually created in the United Kingdom is created by commercial banks. It's not created by the central bank. It's created by commercial banks as credit or as debt. So if I walk into a bank and say, I'd like to take out a loan, and they say, okay, and they create money right there in giving me that loan. It didn't exist before. So we've given banks the power to create money. What will they give me a loan for? Probably to buy a house, maybe to buy some stocks and shares or some financial assets. Probably not to set up a small business because they think that's too risky. So they're channeling money in credit bubbles and inflationary things that actually turn into financial crashes. So really fascinating who has the power to create money and what they give money for. They put an interest rate, which means I need more money and I need more money to grow to pay that money back. Now, once you realize that money is designed and it doesn't have to be designed like that, you can get really excited about the idea of redesigning money for the purposes that you value. So here in front of me, I have, let me hold this up. This is a Bristol Yay! pound. <laughs> so the city of Bristol, in Bristol. The Just city of Bristol has created its own money. Uh, this is worth one pound of English sterling. And you can spend it at all sorts of small businesses, shops, and train stations to buy things in Bristol. This money is issued by the city of Bristol. Its design is to keep money moving through the economy of Bristol. So it's, it's designed especially to support the local economy. Such currencies like this exist in, in uh, the slums of Kenya, in Switzerland. They exist all over the world. Now, Kieran, if you're interested in thinking about the design of money, I strongly recommend you read, well, I've got two books here. Let's have a look. This is a book for you. Mm -hmm. Money by Bernard Litar. He is his name, Bernard Litar. This guy is a money guru. And um, Bernard Litar is brilliant. He says to you, give me any problem in the world, I will design a currency for you that could solve that currency. So if one example in Curitiba in Brazil, there was trash everywhere, litter all over the streets. And there were awful lot of poor people too. So Bernard worked with them to say, we'll design a currency. If people pick up a one ton bag of plastic litter and bring it to this station, they will be paid in the new currency. And the currency was bus tokens for the city of Curitiba. The poor people who needed transport around the city would pick up the litter, take it to the centre, be given bus tokens, and they had transport. So you solve an environmental problem and you solve a poverty problem by creating new currencies. So actually, once we unpick the design of money, we realise you could design it ecosystems. You could design it around all sorts of things. I want to say one more point on this, though, however. When we start putting money into the money, if we don't design that money carefully, we, um, we bring a very financial part of ourselves into the relationship um, we start you know it really changes the relationship if somebody babysits you in favor and you might babysit for them back it's very different if you say oh Sarah will you babysit for me I'll pay you 10 pounds I change the relationship by putting money in the middle of it and it financializes things and we behave differently when, when money things are exchanged for money than when things are exchanged as a gift or reciprocity or mutual support so there's a risk putting money into relationships that we do care about and there's a risk of putting money into our relationship with the environment you can hear I'm, from, I'm worried about the financialization of ecosystems unless people like Bernard Litar and people like Kieran 
are involved and thinking very smartly about how do I design a currency that actually works for what we value and doesn't just financialize away the very thing we were trying to save. That's, a, again, really appreciate that answer because there are a couple of other questions. One was about how do, about the payments to ecosystem services um, as in terms of the relationship, in terms of the interactions of developed and developing countries. And another question by Nicole Brummer um, on how the donut concept can help, sorry, can you put that one live? Um, so Kate can see it too. Um, the loss, you know, as, as people are moving into the climate negotiations in Paris, the um, loss and damage money flows, the monetary aid issues there too. And obviously, don't need you to go into great detail on some of these big multinational, um, multilateral environmental policy contexts, but do you want to come back on those issues of, rather than just the sort of the local level trust-based money? How do we bring trust back into these multinational policy contexts too? Yeah, let me just ask you one thing. Am I still talking too loudly? Slightly. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'm excited that I'm talking too loudly. I'll try and bring it down. Um, loss and damage. It's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because, again, it's we recognize that enormous damage and loss of life and devastation has been uh, brought upon people through nothing of their own doing, through activities that have made enormous profits for companies and countries on the other side of the world. Of course, the first thing we want to do is stop it. Um, but we also want people to be enabled and supported through the damage that they've sustained. The, the dangerous outcome would be if we put in place loss and damage mechanisms, which almost become not payment for ecosystem services, but payment for ecosystem damage. I'll just carry on damaging and I'll pay the levy, I'll pay the price. Right? So we're not trying to put a price on damage, we're trying to prevent damage with some um, re recompense for what has already happened. So that's just the philosophy around loss and damage. Um, I don't know. I don't know how the donut model could directly um, be used. I can imagine getting the donut. I mean, often what I do is I I get the donut and, and sort of draw arrows on it. And maybe maybe you could help people could think, you know, that climate change. What's it done? It's undermined people's food supply. It destroyed their water supply. Uh, it's really had negative impacts on health. It's had actually negative impacts on gender. I could go around, right? I could link up all of these things. So we could use the donut model to look at relationships between the cause of damage and where that, how that damage been incurred on people. I probably would use it as a device for making people understand the connections rather than trying to make calculations of design policies, but for, for understanding the interconnections themselves. It's a very useful tool. Um, Start getting out a pen and, and drawing on those arrows of interconnection. Of course, if you draw on all the arrows, you end up with a spaghetti bowl because we know they are spaghetti bowl together. Um, so we need to rub them off and but and just draw on the arrows that you, that help us in any particular moment. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned the sort of interactions and interrelationships too, because that's a theme I wanted to pick up as well. Um, Franz Schuitz asked the question about, well, in a question sent earlier, but also a question here right now live, about how we would translate um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon flow, to food and food security and, and um, feeding people, the most basic needs of people. So we've got, um, as environmental interactions happening and as there's social interactions happening, sometimes we do need to focus in on some of the sort of these basic connections. Um, obviously here we're working to develop analytical tools that help us to do some of that characterizing and quantifying that you mentioned, but can you comment on some of the how you deal with these interrelationships of different boundaries and the fact that a lot of the risks don't come so much in any one individual wedge in the donut, but through the interactions and through the dependencies of one with the other. Yeah, no, no thanks, Franz, for those questions. I, I saw the question you sent earlier, and it's, it's very uh, good question, thought provoking about how on earth can we provide 
enough food for all within the planetary boundaries i took that as and again food is a great example if you can see here if i draw on here you know food how does it affect it affects biodiversity loss land use change it affects climate change fresh water use if you're using irrigation fertilizers you know it it affects all of the planetary boundaries but of course it depends which food and which food which, which social and, and and physical technologies we use food um, in France's question that he sent earlier, as he pointed out, well, he said, you know, how on earth are we going to provide for everybody? Well, what I often say is, here we are, the percentage of 87% of people in the world have enough food to eat. And if you can see that, I've left a little bit here. There's 13% of people in the world who don't have enough food to eat. So that's 13%. Um, and you can ask the question, well, how much would it take to meet the food needs of those 13% of people? It's around 3% of the global food supply to meet their caloric needs. And you can look at that in relation to the fact that now, currently, between 30 and 50% of the food that's produced in the world is lost post harvest, wasted in supermarket supply chains, or scraped into the rubbish bin in our kitchens. So it's not just about providing more food, it's more, as Franz says, it's about more equitably distributing that food and having purchasing power to that food. Um, the question of the interrelation boundaries. I mean, sometimes when people think that one of the critiques they have of it is saying, but you've segmented everything off and actually it's all interconnected. To which my response is, as long as we see, if we can draw a diagram that makes us see that everything should be interconnected, we are really leaping forward now. Yeah. If anybody sees frustrated by the segments and wants to draw on it all these arrows, that's exactly the response we need. And people say, but you know, what happened? One of the questions was, what happens when there's pressure on climate change and this one and this one and this one? So this is where research I mean, that's what the Stockholm Resilience Center is thinking about. How we've identified these boundaries, how on earth do they interact? And we need to think in the social sphere as well. Now that we see all these what we've known them for, for, for decades since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we recognize these human rights. Which is the really powerful point? <laughs> I believe education and health and gender equality, as I was saying earlier, and population are very, very powerful entry points for turning around this situation. But we need to know which drivers and the levers of change influencing each other. That's a phenomenally important research agenda. And just as a last point, think of the history of medicine. Medics some centuries ago realized there's a digestive system, there's a blood system, there's a nervous system, there's a muscular system. And then there's just been a phenomenal amount of understanding how they interact. And it's understanding the interactions which has made us to stay alive and be so healthy and have medicine. We're in that very same process with the planet and our interaction with the planet. We just need to do it really quickly. Hmm. Oh, oh just one more point on, on France. <laughs> on the question of food, sorry. On the question of very specific questions about food. Friends, I would look at the work of Tara Garnett. Um, look at the Food Climate Research Network. If you Google Food Climate Research Network, it's a fantastic website run by Tara Garnett, hmm. all about the interrelations of climate change and food. And she recently won an award for the work she does. Uh, you'll find a host of information there. Yes. Um, uh, Gosh, there's so many questions coming in right now. I, I haven't, I really haven't kept up. So I encourage you to say something. Actually, okay, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to say I really like a question from Nicholas Chouette Levy. Uh -huh. um, Go on then. He was saying he sent a question earlier, and he said, "Oh, I'm trying to think of what are the social oh, yes, yes. Um, influence planetary boundaries." Um, and he started suggesting things like inequality within and between countries, concentration of natural resources. So, Nicholas, in, in response to you saying, what are the social issues that determine our ability to adapt to and live within planetary boundaries? I've been thinking about exactly this because, as I said earlier, the, the question is, how thick is this donut? How on earth can we live inside it? Um, and I'll just say very briefly, I think of it in terms of six, six processes, and I'll just list them off. One, population size, how many of us there are, we talked about that. Two, inequality of wealth, of power, of income, of control of resources. Three, 
the technologies we use. Do we do geoengineering or do we do GM crops or do we do local seed saving and solar panels? Uh, for the governance system that we use, are we going to learn from Eleanor Ostrom in time and learn how to govern the global commons? Um, are we going to have sensible negotiations in Paris? Are we going to overcome national self-interest and have a global common interest? Six, aspiration. What is it we're aspiring to? What is it that we advertise and tell ourselves is the good life? Because three billion people are going to become middle-class consumers by 2030. What will they want to be doing with their increased incomes? And what will they believe is enough? And then I'm sick. I mean, economics, the worldview of economics, because I studied economics 25 years ago, and it utterly depresses me that when I go into universities now and talk to students, they are learning almost the same theory that I was taught 25 years ago. Economics is the language of public policy. It's the, it's the mother tongue that the policies get made up. And if we keep economic theory completely out of touch with the planet and out of touch with contemporary values, we are... We are completely doing disrespect to the next generation who want to do something constructive about the planet. So I'm passionate about changing economics to make it reflect 21st century realities. So there's six, population, inequality, technology, governance, aspiration, and economics. I'm sure there's plenty more, but those are quite a useful six clusters for seeing how different issues are going to be, whether or not we can live in the donut. So there you are, Sarah. That was plenty of thinking time. Thank you, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, what I really like about your list is how much it actually still ties in with the, I mean, it's no surprise, but the Rio principles that were first set out for global sustainability back in 1992. And the Brundtland report has, a, I mean, a very, very similar list. She missed out aspirations. And I think that would be a really, of the others, all as you know, your points will match up. So I think that increasingly people are, are uh, recognizing to be honest, I don't think in 1992 we had a global mindset. You know, we didn't think of ourselves as global citizens in anything like the way we do. 1992 was before Twitter. 1992 was, you know, the sense that we are all one big community is a very recent thing. And while it's obviously been tied up with a big shift in the last 25 years towards making sustainability an urgent issue, um, it's it's really interesting to see how we can you, you mentioned governance as well how we are all part of steering the world i i think that's a really mm. last week we had a set of questions that we couldn't answer a little bit on these ethical issues and our personal responsibilities in the context of a planetary process um so maybe towards the end we'll pick that theme up again I just say one thing on that. So we did have in 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have recognized. We have an aspiration. We have to recognize ourselves universally, but separately. Yes. And perhaps now, as you're saying, since, since the World Wide Web, we've recognized ourselves universally together, and maybe that's a real shift. We should tweet about that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll fit in 140. Um, just before, I mean, while since you were also talking about economics as a discipline and what the role of economics is in this world, I want to also flag um, Sophie Glippenberg's question on that should be you should be able to see it on your screen now. Um, as we sort of think about the environmental ceiling and the social foundations in the donut, um, how can economic policies be much more about integrating these indicators? Um, for positive results, isn't that really what economic efficiency is all about? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree, Sophie. Um, so how can policies be more about integrating these indicators? So that goes to the heart of what is the goal of economic development? And of course, we know that so far, for the last, ever since around the 1940s, economic development has been seen as GDP growth. So it's the single metric indicator which records the monetary value mm. or, or rather the, the value of the goods exchanged in the monetary economy. 
And for some time, that's that correlated very, very closely with human welfare, right? As the economy grew, people's lives got better. But of course, many people would argue that maybe since the 1980s, actually these things have diverged. Economic growth has carried on, and we've had falling environmental degradation. We've got widening inequality, even in the richest societies, and many millions of people still left behind. So Sophie's absolutely right. People are searching for a wider set of indicators to judge economic success, success by. And of course, there's a wonderful array of indicators out there from the Happy Planet Index, OECD's Better Life Index. So we're in an era, I see, of wonderful evolution and experiments and alternatives and possibilities and the sustainable development goals themselves. Mm. As these are some alternative mm -hmm. metrics of how to judge human progress by. I think the SDGs are really important mm -hmm. because I would hate to live in a world that humanity never got together and said, actually, let's put that obsession with growth aside for a moment and let's talk about the goals that we really value. Mm. The problem is, for me, in my, my worldview, is that you can feel it in the sustainable development goals. The, the, the obsession with growth is still in there. So there's a, a tension between the fundamental goals that we want. Uh, of course, we think we can always do it with growth. And so we haven't let go of the addiction to growth as a necessity. That's, a, that's a, Somebody else was asking about degrowth. Yeah. Um, yes, I was about to flag that. Maria Perona's question on degrowth. Do you want to comment more explicitly on degrowth as an idea? Yes. So I'm going to... It's a, a huge topic. Uh, well, they're all huge topics. Degrowth. So degrowth is the idea that well, anybody who's into planetary boundaries is already into the first half of degrowth, which is we need to grow, as in shrink back our material and energy throughput on this planet mm -hmm. back within planetary boundaries. That's the that's the starting point of degrowth. And then degrowth is and the green growth is part company. They both agree on that. The green growth is say, yeah, and we can do that. We can have economy people growing while we come back within planetary boundaries. We're going to have a technology revolution. We're going to transform energy systems. We can do that. The degrowth is say, I really don't think we can do that, actually. And if we're serious about coming back within planetary boundaries, you know what? We're going to have economies, especially high income economies today, that are not growing. So we had better prepare ourselves to enable our economies not to grow without a disaster. We don't want a disaster, that's just a recession. No one wants a recession. We need to redesign the economic institutions we have so that they enable us to thrive without growing. And I, the way I tend to think of it is right now, we have economies that are designed to grow, whether or not that makes us thrive. What we need is economies that make us thrive, whether or not they grow. It's a complete fit, and that's what the degrowth community is trying to do. We were, I, I'm, I'm teaching in Oxford, we were very lucky to have Yorgos Kallis, who's one of the leading thinkers on degrowth, in a lecture um, in Oxford last night. All of his slides are um, online. If you just click into my Twitter feed, a few tweets back, I've, I've tweeted a link to his electric slides. Oh, and one last thing on that. I did a blog on this, um, connecting the SDGs with the growth question a while ago. It's called, uh, "Do Will These SDGs Get Us Into the Donut? Um, yeah. If somebody was to Google that again, you'll see me trying to relate the donut to the SDGs and then honing in on the fact that there's a real hidden problem in the middle of it which is the SDGs are still wedded to growth and they haven't bitten the bullet in terms of realizing that we need to get very very serious about decoupling if we're going to come back within planetary boundaries and still have growing economies mm. it gives a graph there it helps unpack the decoupling concept which is key to understanding this but I mean you've been sort of throwing in all sorts of really really juicy information resources that people can go and look at later and actually so have several other people too you can see right. in the comment things that people are beginning to sort of oh, share, okay. share this mode for those people who are registered in the MOOC we have forum um, lines and discussion groups where people can actually share this information and get into more detailed discussions. And again, I'd want to flag a recent discussion theme where Franz um, Schuitz goes through an expanded version he's, of, of the question that he's presented today on food security, its relationship to material resource flows. And again, um, the definition of safety, as you look at it from both a, a 
by a geophysical and a human health perspective. So there's a lot, I mean, that's just one example of several discussions that are happening um, on, the, on the MOOC um, forum. And so I'd encourage people who are watching and listening now to also plant their information resources there. Um, it spreads around the world. So I really appreciate you sharing these ideas too, Kate, but thank you to all of the participants for that as well. And I'll send um, you all the links that I've mentioned at the end of this. Excellent. excellent. We'll post it on the forum. That'd be great. Um, there's a couple of two questions that I sort of see related as sort of cultural questions. One is, what about dominant cultures? How do we escape our own anthropocentric perspective? Um, and the other one is sort of related in the sense that, at the moment, my anthropocentric perspective is a northern European, slightly chilly, um, <laughs> academic perspective. But there are people all around the world. <laughs> people all around the world living a very different lived experience. There's a question by Nawar Ali on how do I raise awareness of planetary boundaries, of this sort of the concepts of global sustainability in my place in complicated, volatile countries like Syria, for example. So there's the, the various issues there of the fact that we live in a world with so many different cultural perspectives. Um, but at the same time, the one thing they all share in common is a little bit of a, a, a human-centered view, not, uh, not all with a sense of how our human societies are connected to the environments that we live within. Um, D. Schnei, I, I can't remember who is, I know that. I, <laughs> I should remember your name, sorry, um, because I've seen it before. Um, brings up utilitarian values and private ownership and the fact that that you know in in effect privatizing the benefits of collective society while we leave the risks and the damages and everything else left to be shared by the collective how there you go an economic spin on the cultural question Kate. okay so d schnei 333 has thrown in two massive questions <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, let's have a little go at both of them. Our dominant culture. Um, I have six-year-old twins, and my daughter said to me yesterday, Mommy, it's so unfair on all the other animals because it's just humans, humans, humans everywhere. And I thought, yeah, you get it. <laughs> um, but it, it, the, the anthropocentrism is, is really interesting, isn't it? Because this, uh, whenever I present this, this is a very anthropocentric model. This mm. is a safe and just world for us. And when I present it, I'm often intentionally provocative. Um, I'm often presenting audiences of economists, um, well, people who introduce me as an environmental something, which I have zero environmental qualifications. I mean, so the fact that I'm talking about the environment, they suddenly think I'm this environmental something. So I. <laughs> I often introduce the donut and I say, you know, these nine planets, this is not an environmental agenda. This is a human agenda. And I even, I hope a little bit and I say, these nine planets have not been designed to protect polar bears and tree frogs. They've been designed to protect us. It's an entirely anthropocentric frame because the Holocene is a very, very nice place for humanity. It's great for polar bears too. We are fighting for it for humanity. And of course, this is very anthropocentric. This is about putting on the planet, putting pressure on the planet to meet human rights. So it's a very valid criticism if somebody wanted to say, well, where's, where's animal rights? Where's the rest of the animal world? Of course, if we protect these boundaries, we would be doing, including biodiversity, we'd be doing quite a lot to protect the rights and the well-being of the animals that are alive today with us in the Holocene. Um, but it would be a fair point. This is an anthropocentric frame, and I suppose with frame, it's a strategic question. Who am I talking to? Who am I trying to persuade? Where are they starting? And where am I trying to bring them to? Mm. Starting with people who are exceeding and think that their well being lies in these things and, and, and material consumption. And for me, the power of the frame is to say, you know what? 
our well-being actually has two fundamental. I nearly did that. That's wrong. <laughs> fundamental constituents. Our well-being depends on everybody having the resources they need to be getting their rights. We've known that since 1948. But what the Earth System scientists are teaching us is that our well-being also depends on protecting these planetary life support systems because they are the fundamental <laughs> systems which give us all of these things. And when I give a talk, it's not like that, that these are the two sides of our well-being. That's the most profound realization you can get and of course it takes enlarges our anthropocentricity because it makes us realize that anthropocentric interests are actually biosphere holocene interests mm. so that's where i'm coming from and i i'm 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 honest about it. I know this is an anthropocentric brain, but i think it's the thing we need to take the next step in our awareness and maybe one day we'll take ourselves out of the center of the picture but right now we need to put ourselves into the biosphere and understand that relationship. Um, now, the second half of these nice question: What role? I'm going to decide utilitarian because it means so many different things. I can't actually walk. I'm not sure exactly what's meant there, but I'm going to pick in on the words ownership, private, socialized. So, I'm going to come back to economics. Um, all around the world, there are students learning economics for the first time it's the first term of the academic year what's the first graph they'll be taught what's the first graph they'll be taught sarah do you know <laughs> um, yeah, a supply and demand curve <laughs> and that's the, it's it's all sort of the dna of economic theory but the minute we draw a supply and demand curve and teach these students about supply and demand curves, what we've already done without telling it's like a magician without telling you i'm talking about the market economics is the market and then you'll learn about the state so you'll learn about the efficiency of the market then you'll learn a little bit about the incompetence of the state you know states, they really get it wrong they make a bit of a mess they're, they're a bit corrupt so it's best to let the market on it get on with it and then if you do some curious options like environmental something you might learn about Eleanor Ostrom and this thing called the commons and you'll learn about the, or, or first you'll learn about the tragedy of the commons, right? You learn about the efficiency of the market, the incompetence of the state, and the tragedy of the commons. This is a complete setup, and a complete, uh, I don't have a bad enough word for it, it's a travesty, it's outrageous. Economics first lecture, okay, there are three realms of ownership, very simply. There's the private ownership, and that's where markets exist because things have to be privately owned to be tradable with a legal contract. Then there's the realm of public ownership, public property and the state providing public goods. Then there's the realm of the commons. And by the way, so much of your life has already been provided through the commons. All the neighborhood communities, the associations and the volunteering, everything that you're engaged in that's not paid for is commons. Even the bath, even the basin in your bathroom where you brush your teeth and you have to hope that your other family members don't leave their toothbrush or something dirty on the basin. I think of the basin, a commons, that we have little rules around how we look after our bathroom basin and tell each other off and mess with it. So if every lecture, every course started, market, state, commons, they are all valuable. Now, when should goods and services be produced under which different model and what makes these different models work? Again, it's one of those fundamental <laughs> insights for people to learn from day one. So what role for the values that say ownership is private while risk is socialized? Well, that's the politics of how we manage these things. We privatize profit and we shove risks and costs into the commons, leaving the commons to pick it up. We need that economic awareness that there are these three models and they're all very valuable and all have different and interacting roles to play. You don't want one of them, you want all three of them interacting respectfully then we start to transform economics. I can't wait for your textbook to come out, actually. <laughs> I know, but it should be, Darren. Um, <laughs> okay, now I'm just going to scoot up and down the questions. Um, dooby dooby doo. Oh, there's some really quite complicated questions around here now. Um, the one about Syria. The one about Syria, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Noah Ali's question. Great question. So now I said, how can someone raise awareness about planetary boundaries, especially in a volatile atmosphere like Syria? Wow. 
Noah, you're taking us to what we're all now aware of as one of the, the toughest and most vulnerable places in the world. Um, so you're writing a thesis on the development of waste management. Okay, I, I want Sarah's answer to this as well. I'm my I would say, at the heart, what your what your thesis is about is about the local resource boundary and local protecting local ecosystems and the local quality of the of ecological services. You could refer to the planetary, but your hometown is going to hit destructive and damaging boundaries way way before they have any impact on the global. So we need to think about it. The planetary boundaries are exciting because it's the first time we've said, let's look at the whole together. But we've always, for years, been looking at the regional, the watershed, the local. So I think the focus of your work is on the local, but you could very nicely put it in relation to the whole and say, this is a global problem, but of course it comes down to a local scale. What can we learn from other cities? What can we learn from other scales about waste management here? And I suppose, I suppose one thing you could do is say, looking at alternative waste management solutions, how do we ensure that we choose one that doesn't put undue pressure on the planetary boundary? So we use the planetary boundary checklist for making choices between alternative management systems. Sarah, what would you say? No, that's almost exactly what I'd say. I think that um, there's, it's a discussion that's happening very much right now in, in things like the life cycle impact assessment community in particular, where Back to Kate's donut picture, where every time we show that something fits within a particular wedge or we've categorized and divided and simplified something so that we can analyze it, it tells us something new about the overall synthesis and the complexity of the interactions of everything. So often, I mean, I think what we're seeing in things like the life cycle analysis community right now is there have been very focused on saying we need to make things better than we had before. So they're starting with two, two options. Is one better than the other or not? But that still doesn't say very much about what the baseline is for the sum of everything when everything is connected to everything else. And so the planetary boundaries is one way of helping us to remember that they are, well, that we shouldn't just keep doing these relative comparisons of things if that means that the baseline is also changing, is also slipping as we go. Because when we think about the whole of everything connected with everything else, that's the system that is the system that's capable of having the transformations, of, of shifting to a configuration where we might not like the outcome. And so this problem of not just a, a sort of a steady trend in a baseline, but a fundamental shift in the baseline that we take as our normal working operating space for our local communities, our businesses, our, our academic pursuits, whatever it may be, when the, the planetary boundaries is a way to remind us to hold that complexity, even though it's actually a very simple framework with yeah. a set of a set of wedges. Um, so as we're we're talking about waste management or local production flows or whatever it might be in a particular place very often we'll be measuring that against i mean we've got a lot of really detailed information for for carbon emissions now generally speaking um, and for particular aspects of the footprint of an, an activity for an ecological footprint or a water footprint in those the sort of the footprinting toolkit that's coming out now is very good at identifying the impact of an issue in a particular context. Here, the planetary boundaries framework certainly doesn't have all the answers yet, but it does tell us that we need to look at all of those footprints together and to think about how the, the bigger picture is changing around our, our efforts in any one particular context. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's... We've got just a few more minutes, so let's pick a really juicy question. <laughs> so, and while you're picking it, I'll just say if anybody does have ideas for me about revising the donut, I'll, I'll skim these questions and type something here or email me. Excellent. Tweet me. I would love it. Now's the time because now I'm really shaping it up. In it. 
for our closing question, I, we've picked one by Nicole Brummer again. Um, the, is the climate change challenge a reason for the world to become much more unified on a collective basis? Could it help to create and preserve peace in the whole world? And um, how do we convince those who believe in the power of markets about this radical lefty evolution? <laughs> I need to take that in again. Is the climate change challenge a reason for the world to become much more unified on a collective basis? Yeah, I mean, well, we hope so. Well, Nichols written a question that he knows the answer is. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, if we right, if you recognise you've got a a, a a shared commons, you need a shared response or a shared resource that you collectively depend upon each other for stewarding. You need a shared resource to do that. Um, could it also help create and preserve peace in the whole world? And there's the point. <laughs> because I often, I, so the- I just want peace here, please. <laughs> the, the analogy I often make when I'm in a conference, um, and I'll talk about planetary boundaries, and, and yes, they make us see we've got this shared resource. But when you talk about limits, which is essentially what planetary boundaries are doing in saying there's a limit to the safe amount of carbon dioxide emissions we can create. When you talk about limits, you immediately, yeah. even if it's unspoken, you recognize the distribution. And I'll often, if somebody locked the doors and said, you all have to stay in this room for 24 hours, there's no more food or drink coming into the room. So there we are, there's a limit on our water supply. The first, and I do this, and the first thing that happens is people look down and they <laughs> pick up their cup or they look and see where the water jugs are because we immediately know there's a limit then how is that limit going to be distributed and that's where and that's where we don't go for peace in the whole world we go for competition and the question is how on earth in the face of what we know are limited resources between us how on earth can we create governance and empathy and that three-legged race that was suggested at the beginning of working together so that we share these common resources because if we don't we are going to descend into conflict somebody talked about uh, uh nicholas talked about weaponization right how uh, to what extent are we going to have more wars about oil or control over other resources so it's it's a huge question and can we convince the market believers of the lefty evolution i'm going to work with the next generation of open minds and before they become market believers because somebody told them all about the efficiency of the market on day one i'm going to teach them well my dream right i would love to say hey there's the market, there's the state, and there's the commons. Now let's look at the resources that we need to steward, and let's ask ourselves, which is the best form of ownership for creating this? So often we'll realise it's the commons. And to end on a good note, thank God for the internet, and for more distributed technology, solar technologies, and communications technologies, because we are, we are the first generation that have the means of production in our hands. Here we are talking. Zero marginal cost. We're having this conversation because we each have a little bit of information technology. We can distribute the means of production into the commons, and so we have a chance to redistribute the ownership of wealth and the creation of things amongst ourselves, and not have it centralised under the market. So times are changing, and you don't even have to be left to see it happening. And yeah, I'll come in on that. Actually, we're going to come back for one final little bit. Um, I've been working quite a bit with market believers. I'm working with investment banks at the moment, and I was recently at a meeting on Arctic shipping, where many people will be aware that Shell is no longer um, planning um, major drilling initiatives in the Arctic. And that, to a very large extent, was influenced by financial, okay, it was influenced by public engagement, and we should continue to keep that kind of public engagement in big environmental issues, even when those issues are a long way away. But it was also very much influenced by good business decisions by the insurance companies and by the pressure of other companies who don't want first mover risk to affect their future prospects for any kind of environmental intervention for the next 50 years. So I think market actors not just market believers are actually very very in more than i've ever seen very aware of some of the um well they're very aware that what scientists are saying about the future prospects for the whole planet makes a grim sense and it needs to be taken very seriously when science says unambiguously 
there are boundaries that we need to operate within because of the fundamental dynamics of the planet. They're able to explore. I mean, and you talked about how money could be created for particular reasons. The machinery of the market can be steered to respond to these issues as well. So I haven't ever dared ask my market actors what side of a political spectrum they're on. And luckily, they haven't probed me too much. But I can say the conversations happen and they're informed conversations They're, I think, you know, there aren't many people who want planetary destruction or at least who openly say that. Um, do you have any final, final comments, Kate? Because yeah, so on, that, on that, so as you said, that you know, the market <laughs> machinery, and one of the things that in the way we're taught to think about the market machinery is that it's this free market, right? There's the supply curve just hanging there in the air and there's the demand curve. Carl Polanyi was a fantastic political theorist, uh, political economist, let's call him, and he said, never forget, the market is always and everywhere embedded in institutions, in laws, in society, in culture. There is no such thing as a free market. It's shaped entirely by the governance that we have, by com uh, uh, the culture around it, by what people will allow. So it's the market for drilling in, in, the, in the Arctic is shaped by the prospect of stranded assets. And that's a governance issue about saying we will not bring this all out of the ground. It's shaped by people marching in the street and the cultural norms of what's socially acceptable. It's probably also shaped by the fact that some of the senior executives in Shell have children who come home and say, Daddy, what are you doing? Mommy, what is this you work for? I've heard about what you're doing. And that, and that prompts their own emotion which we must never leave at home when we go to work right and it prompts our connection to the future so all of these things shape markets and so as, as citizens we mustn't forget that power we mustn't you know, banish the words you know, you never said it all of us must banish the words free market from our vocabulary because it doesn't exist and therefore we have the power to shape that market as well as take power away from it by re-expanding the commons that's my final word Wonderful, wonderful. And this conversation could, and I really hope it does carry on for a long, long time, but it's going to have to stop on this hangout right now. Um, thank you to everybody for your wonderful, wonderful yeah, questions. Great question. Uh, being so generous with the information that you've provided in the comments um, and for your time, of course. And oh, thank pleasure. you Lisa, for nudging the questions up the page for me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Bye-bye.